Good afternoon, everyone. Um, just in case anybody can hear me, can you put a little quick thumbs up? I just want to make sure that we've got audio working okay. All right, good. Thank you. Uh, I'm really glad that everybody could join us uh, this afternoon for our first um, part of our summer speaker series with Save California Salmon and uh, for the Advocacy and Water Protection in Native California series and certificate program. And I'm, we're going to take just a couple minutes to kind of get everybody in and uh, make sure that people are settled. And then after that, we're hoping that people can turn off their cameras because some of our speakers are in uh, very rural communities. And sometimes with Zoom, it helps if we don't have cameras running while they're presenting. Um, once we get through the presentation part, we can ask people if they want to turn their cameras on and um, so we can see everybody. Uh, we're very happy to be here today. We had a couple of technical difficulties to start, but we're getting everything figured out so that we can make sure that this works really well. I wanted to just take a minute to say that I'm very grateful that we've had, we have so many participants and um, you're all muted at this point. And so if you want to ask a question, you can use the chat feature, which is at the bottom part of the Zoom screen. And um, our research assistant, Carrie Tully, will be able to sort of help uh, answer questions or get questions to us. We're going to run the program a little bit like this today. We're going to do a quick overview of the series for you and then we will go to our speakers. Um, uh, I'm the first speaker, Regina will be the second and then after that's done we'll, we'll have some time for questions. If you have questions while we're speaking you can type them into the chat and at the end of the program we'll come back and see like where the questions are and I'll let you know when it's time to ask questions. So I wanted to start today by um, saying hello. My name is Dr. Ketra Rizling baldi and uh, my co-presenter is Regina from Save California Salmon. And we'll each have a time to introduce ourselves before we present. Um, I wanted to do a quick check-in with people because we did send out to anybody who registered for today and for the program, we sent out the full program that we have been putting together for the summer speaker series that includes short abstracts and an idea of how the speaker series is going to go. So um, I'm going to share my screen right now. And what you will see, hopefully, is, um, is the actual program that we have made available. If you did not receive a copy but would like to, please feel free to send us a message about that and we can put up a copy for you. We are gonna be putting up a more final draft of the program uh, early next week. It'll be on the Save California Salmon website and we'll share it via all of our social media so you can get links to being able to download what the program looks like. It goes specifically through uh, the speaker series, maybe the flyer that you've seen, also the requirements for the certificate in advocacy and water protection in native california that includes attending these three core courses there's one per month in the first friday of the month uh, selecting five elective webinars that you would like to attend and then attending or presenting at our day-long event that will be september 25th uh, where we're going to have multiple presentations on water advocacy throughout california we're right now in module one which begins in june of 2020 and Today, we're doing Understanding Water Policy, Law, and Tribal Sovereignty. Next week, we'll be doing the State of Salmon and Water Wars on the Klamath River. The week after that, from the Trump Water Plan to the Shasta Dam Raise, the fight for Sacramento River Bay Delta Salmon. And then the week after that, Bringing Salmon Home, Eel River Dam Removal. Um, I'm really looking forward to all these panels having an opportunity to catch people up on where water policy and water politics are right now in California. I will also say that if you are registered for the certificate program, one of the requirements is that you need to fill out an evaluation form when, this, uh, when the webinars are over. It helps us to get feedback about how the presentation went and what we need to follow up on. Uh, and then it'll also be a space for you all to reflect on things that you've been learning. There is an actual link to the module one evaluation form, both in the email that you received with, this, um, with the webinar registration, and then also here in the program. And the evaluation form looks a little like this. It's, it's asking you some questions about which class you attended and then some things that you thought about uh, the presentations and the things that you learned about. So it's an opportunity to kind of give us some feedback. Once you fill those out, it helps us to know that you've attended the event and uh, reflect on it. And then we can count that toward the certificate program. Um, 
So I, I, I ask you to go through the program as you see fit. And like I said, once we get the finalized program, we're still confirming some speakers. We'll be sending out the finalized program and we'll put it up everywhere and then you can have a copy of that as well. So I, I'm going to start off uh, our presentation today and I wanted to do a quick um, introduction of myself. I'm Dr. Kutcher Risling Baldy. I'm the department chair of Native American Studies at Humboldt State University. I just received tenure this week. So that's my big news. I'm now a tenured professor at Humboldt State. Um, and I do my work uh, in Native American studies on decolonization in California Indians. And I really look at environmental justice, but also um, how we can kind of work toward cultural revitalization and the role that culture, culture plays in the things that we do. Uh, the presentations that we're gonna give today will be made available on Save California Salmon's website and you can follow along with them. So we're gonna make this presentation available. You'll be able to like download it and have it. And on top of that, we're gonna make each of these videos being recorded available on, the, on YouTube. And so you should be able to watch them again if you'd like to, or if there are people that can't attend, then they can attend um, by watching via YouTube and then filling out the evaluation form for the certificate program. So I, going to go full screen. Uh, I'm trying to do a very quick sort of overview. And I, when I say quick, it's like very quick. It's a lot of things that I would normally cover in my uh, Native American studies classes um, on law and policy that would take almost like an entire semester. And I'm going to do it very fast. I will say that we kind of anticipated that there would be people participating, some of whom might have a lot of experience working with tribes and communities in California. And, tri and tribal histories and some who might have none. And so we wanna do kind of a broad spectrum to kind of get people on the same page of understanding water policy law and tribal sovereignty. And like I said, I'm gonna go through it very quickly. I will encourage you that if you become very curious and you're like, I need to know more about that, uh, you can take any Native American studies class at Humboldt State through extended education. And I would sign up for a class in a heartbeat knowing that it'll help you to kind of really clarify some of the things that people are doing. And I'll also say that many of our other core courses are gonna cover these things again in slightly different ways. So you'll get a good foundation in what it means to kind of look at tribal sovereignty throughout this series. Let's see. Um, so a quick overview of California. Uh, prior to what they call like colonization, but what California Indians refer to as invasion, there were close to 1 million people in California. This is the largest population north of Mexico. Um, oops. And I don't know why, hold on, I gotta pause it. Let's see. It must be set at like a timer or something. Um, I don't want to run out of time. Okay. Let's see. Okay. So it's the closest, uh, it's the largest population north of Mexico. In 1769, they're able to establish that there are 310,000 people living in California. But by 1900, it's less than 20,000. And when you're talking about a reduction of 90% of the population, you're really looking at the genocide that happened against California Indians. Uh, during the, 1800, the 1700s and 1800s that resulted in a massive population reduction. But in 2010, with the, new, with the census that they did, they were able to establish that there were now 720,000 Native American people living in California, not necessarily just California Indians, were approximately 1.7% of the state. This varies significantly by region. For instance, in Humboldt County, we are close to 6 to 7% of the population. So in Humboldt County, we're a very significant population when you're looking at uh, the fact that across the United States, there are some regions where people are less than 1% of the population. There are 109 federally recognized tribes in California. There are approximately 80 tribes that are petitioning for recognition. There are tribes that are unrecognized who are not petitioning for recognition. So California has one of the most diverse numbers of tribes in uh, the entirety of the United States. And it's important to recognize that because we have a number of tribes that we would need to um, consider when we're making any sorts of policies and that tribes throughout California are everywhere. There are over 100 reservations and rancherias and even some allotment lands right now in California, which makes that Indian country. 
And if you look at this map of California tribal lands, you see that they're spread throughout California, sometimes in very significant spaces, sometimes sort of like dotted spaces throughout. So you're talking about tribes throughout the region. When I think about what I want people to get from this speaker series in particular, I ask that we kind of think about the work that and labor that's going into it, especially by California Indian people during a time when we're having to contend with a pandemic that is really affecting uh, communities of color much more than other communities. And so I am really interested in thinking about how we can take to heart some of the things that that I am thinking about as, as we put this speaker series together. The first I would say is um, approach this as a space of learning instead of knowing and assuming a humble posture in learning. I like to think about how these types of trainings and immersions should not be optional for people. Actually, when we think about indigenous peoples in space, we should consider them essential to what we do in any of our organizations or any of our work. Uh, I build approaches that are based in indigenous community philosophies directly and uphold relationships with communities and extend funding opportunities to indigenous communities. I think when we talk about what can we do and what are we here for, the work that we're doing should really be thinking about how do we center indigenous knowledges, but then how do we support them in that through actual funding and a stream that helps to make it so that they can do the things that they need to do for water protection. I link research to indigenous languages. I use indigenous words for understanding things. When we think about how do we conceptualize what we wanna do with indigenous communities when it comes to things like policy and law and advocacy. So if we're gonna talk about health, law, policy, sustainability, those things should come from indigenous communities. They should be defined by them and they should use their languages and words to be able to say, this is what they are. Let's see. And then finally, I find ways in anything that I do to address structural problems such as racism, prejudice, poverty, and misogyny. We have to call these things out all the time. If there is a policy, a law, something that you're working with, I think we need to start saying this is a racist policy. This is a policy that is based on prejudice. This is not a, you know, like it's not sort of trying to play both sides. It's actually trying to um, uphold misogyny. It's trying to keep people in poverty. Those are the kinds of things that I hope people will get from the work that we continue to do. So I'm going to very quickly go over sovereignty and sovereignty being defined in the United States in a very particular way at this point as it pertains to tribal nations thinking about what makes something sovereign, and then thinking about what makes native tribal sovereignty different than other kinds of sovereignty. Sovereignty is one of the key terms that I teach in my classes to try to get students to understand how they talk about, but also what it means to actually uphold sovereignty of tribal nations. I get a lot of people that I work with who do things with government agencies, and oftentimes they're telling me like, well, the policy doesn't support us doing that when it comes to tribal sovereignty. And I always say, well, then the policy is wrong because sovereignty is inherent and sovereignty is the most important thing that we can uphold. And so maybe we need to do things that uphold sovereignty, even if an old policy was written not to do that. A couple of key terms that you need to know in order to um, understand this. So you have uh, Aboriginal land claims. This is where Indian people are under Aboriginal land claims have a right to land use and occupancy. And it is only the United States government that can settle those claims. And this is something important to consider because we um, often work with uh, different agencies that don't sort of understand kind of some of these key terms. So the idea that we have land rights and occupancy but and only the United States government can settle that. It's not the states that are allowed to settle that. We also need to be in consideration of things like unceded land, treaty lands, and reservation lands, which can be different than Aboriginal land claims, or they can be the same. There's a number of cases, especially in California, where we have tribes that signed treaties during the 1800s that were not ratified. And because of that, you have lands now that were unceded to the federal government legally, and they were just stolen and taken. And so when we think about what are the lands that are indigenous lands in California, there's a number of unceded lands, there's a number of treaty lands that were not ratified, and then there's also reservation lands. When we talk about tribal sovereignty, we're looking at tribes maintaining similar rights to sovereign nations with the authority to govern themselves. 
This is uh, primarily because tribes existed as sovereign nations before the United States of America. So theirs is a very mature sovereignty. And what's important to understand is that our sovereignty predates the United States. It predates the Constitution and it exists outside of the Constitution. And so looking to the Constitution as the only document to understand how we're supposed to interact with tribes uh, doesn't work because our documents and our treaties and our sovereignty exists outside of that document. When we look at federal trust responsibility, we're talking about the fact that the federal government has a responsibility to protect Indian lands and resources and to provide essential services to Indian people. The federal trust responsibility has been reaffirmed several times in law uh, by the Supreme Court of the United States. And it's something that Native people talk a lot about when they are talking about like what is the role that the government is supposed to play with Native tribes. So I often will introduce students to this concept that our sovereignty is much older than the United States of America by talking to them about the wampum belts of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And so the Haudenosaunee Confederacy is um, a, a tribal confederacy uh, that is on the East Coast, sort of Northeast, uh, goes both into Canada and the United States. You, many people know them as the Iroquois Confederacy. And one thing to sort of keep in mind is that the Haudenosaunee Confederacy were making documents and treaties with each other and other tribal nations prior to the existence of the United States. And this is one example of a treaty that uh, is part of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And what it is, is an, the Hiawatha Belt, which kind of documents the great law of peace. So when we think about tribal peoples as not having a documented history, that is a, um, that's a fiction that's created trying to say that somehow we were prehistoric right before history, but we were creating really important historical documents about this very long period of time prior to colonization where we're doing multiple things to build nations and these nation documents are treaties and constitutions. They are sort of the things that we're building but really the way that we build that is on relationship. And so what we're constantly documenting is the relationship that we have with peoples and lands. And we're thinking about like, what is our interrelationship to each other? So when you look at the squares in this document, they actually represent nations of the league and how they're connected together. And this is a founding document. The same goes for this. This is actually the first treaty between a European nation and the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And so when the Haudenosaunee Confederacy decided to make a treaty with uh, the Dutch traders, they did it in this way. So these are our founding documents. We had a number of documents that show how we exercise our sovereignty. If you look at this treaty, it's saying we are gonna maintain sovereignty from each other. We have two nations, they exist in the same place, but they're not going to come together, but they will govern in peaceful cooperation with each other. All of that is contained here in this wampum belt. They have this knowledge of what it means and how they're going to work together and maintain their separate governments. This has also been, this was also done significantly with um, the United States of America. So in 1794, you have a treaty that was done with the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And in that treaty, they both documented it in sort of like the English version pen to paper, and they documented it through a wampum belt. So they understood wampum belts as documents of treaties that were talking about what sovereignty was supposed to look like. And this is why this is important because we were conceptualizing sovereignty, intergovernmental relations, how we dealt with each other as nations prior to the United States and the minute that we started talking to the United States. We were always about maintaining our sovereignty as sovereign nations. And what I like to say to people is if you look at the number of documents that were signed between early colonists and then tribal nations, early colonists very much acknowledge the sovereignty of tribal peoples as having sovereignty over the land, the resources, the water, the areas that they governed and lived in, and that they needed permission and partnerships to be there. And so from the beginning, they understood it. It wasn't something that, that was sort of like uh, given, we didn't, they didn't give sovereignty to tribes. Tribes had sovereignty and were treated as sovereign nations. So treaties then become the document that we primarily think about when we think about tribes and understanding sovereignty. 
uh, it's a very formal document between nations. And what it says is you have to be a nation in order to negotiate with another nation. When making treaties, what that acknowledges is that the two parties know that they are both nations. I, I constantly tell students, you know, we couldn't like sort of come together today and say we're a country and start trying to make treaties unless another country or another nation recognized us and said, yes, we will make a treaty with you. So treaties were supposed to document how people were going to work together, provide tangible outcomes. We still make treaties to this day with multiple countries, but every treaty that has ever been made with a tribe in the United States has in some way been broken. And so you look at how that speaks to what we understand about the strength of treaties for the United States, because they have broken every single treaty with tribes. In California, the treaties that were made with California Indian tribes were not ratified. So the Cal in, during California history in the 1800s, they sent people to make treaties with tribes to try to get them to peacefully move on to certain lands. And those treaties were unratified by Congress and then put under an injunction of secrecy. And part of that was pressure from um, citizens of California because they felt like it was unfair that tribes were getting to make treaties. And so they, they said no to the treaties. They put them under an injunction of secrecy, but they never told California Indians that that's what was happening. And so many California Indians moved to lands that they had said that they were going to live on. And then they were told, well, you abandoned this area and you've moved to a place you're not supposed to be. And so what you see is tribes losing large areas of land even though they had signed treaties with the United States. They were kept under an injunction of secrecy for a number of years. And um, what that resulted in was that tribes had to hastily kind of go and renegotiate. Some tribes fought wars to try to keep their treaty territories. And still to this day, you have tribes who had signed treaties with the United States who are unrecognized. So even though they had a treaty, because those treaties are unratified, they're now considered unrecognized tribes and are told that they don't get to have, they don't get to be a part of like government to government negotiations. And it, it feels very, um, it's, it's kind of, it's unfounded to say that because they did sign those treaties. So there's, there's lots of evidence that they should be federally recognized tribes. The other documents besides treaties that they use to discuss and understand tribal sovereignty is the constitution, uh, specifically one section, the commerce clause of the constitution, article one, section eight, clause three. There are only three forms of sovereign entities that are mentioned in the US constitution, states, foreign nations, and Indian tribes. Indian tribes are specifically named as one of the three sovereign entities. And this is important because you have an instance in which the constitution is saying states, foreign nations, and Indian tribes are the three sovereign entities that we recognize um, in the United States. The Commerce Clause has been interpreted by the Supreme Court as giving the power of regulating things happening with Indians solely to Congress with no power to the states. And it is Congress who is supposed to regulate uh, commerce with Indian tribes, which has then subsequently been uh, interpreted as Congress regulates everything with Indian tribes. They call that plenary power. This leads us to the Marshall Trilogy, which are three foundational federal Indian law cases that try to define sovereignty or that people use now to kind of talk about sovereignty. And so this were primarily under uh, Justice John Marshall, the first Supreme Court Justice of the United States, first uh, head justice. And he did the Marshall Trilogy beginning in 1823. And these three cases kind of are how people use um, the words that he was writing to define what sovereignty is supposed to look like for Indian tribes in the United States. In Johnson v. McIntosh, uh, jo what the court found is that Indians did not own land outright, but had rights to occupy lands. And what was important about this case is it was them writing about what they called the discovering nation and the doctrine of discovery. And so what they enshrined into law at this point was that when um, colonists had come over, they had discovered the United States. And because of that, they were the only ones who could settle land rights 
with Indian tribes. The Doctrine of Discovery, I highly recommend people look up more about it. It is still enshrined in our law that you can discover a place that is filled with millions of people who already have rights and claims that you have previously established because remember, they were dealing with Indian nations as nations as if they had full and total rights to land and resources. And then uh, this case comes in and says, we were the discovering nation. So this is something that a lot of Native people work on getting overturned and are talking about what would it look like to overturn the doctrine of discovery? And is a doctrine of discovery enough of a base of law for the claims that we seem to think that we have to things like land and water? Now, in the second case, Cherokee Nation v. Georgia, what the court found is that Indians are not foreign nations. They are what they call domestic dependent nations. And this is one place in which they really start redefining the type of sovereignty that Indian tribes have in the United States. And they say they are domestic dependent nations and that tribal sovereignty is limited by being within the boundaries of the United States. But they do reaffirm in this case that sovereignty is inherent and predated the United States. And so they really look at us as we, we are defined by our dependent status on the United States of America. So they start to redefine our sovereignty as something a little bit different. In Wooster v. Georgia, what the court finds is that the federal government, not the states, is who has authority over Indian affairs. They call this the doctrine of federal trust responsibility. And so they're basically saying that the states don't get to come in and buy land directly from tribes. They don't get to come in and regulate what goes on with tribes because it is only the federal government that is supposed to do that. And it is the federal government that has a federal trust responsibility to doing that, which they entered into under treaties and under these negotiations that they had made with tribes directly. And because tribes are nations, domestic dependent nations, according to them, but nations. Just because this is the definition that's been offered by the Supreme Court of what sovereignty could look like does not mean that tribes at any time agreed to this or said, you're correct, we always viewed ourselves as domestic dependent nations. In fact, we know from history that that's not true, that what they were building were equal nations. If we look back at the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, their lines in their treaty document with the Dutch were equal. We were equal nations sharing equal space and we were here to govern together, like we needed to govern in partnership these spaces that we were sharing, that our, that our sovereignty was important to that. One of the biggest cases that in terms of sovereignty and tribal water rights to know about is the Winters Doctrine. So the Winters Doctrine comes out of the Winters v. U.S. case. And this was an important case for establishing what happens uh, with water rights in uh, throughout the throughout the United States with tribes specifically. And so what the case found was that uh, for the, 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 the Supreme Court said that tribes had what they called first in time, first in right rights to water. And that when the United States and Congress set aside land for Native American tribes to live on, it implied that at the same time that they were reserving water for water rights. So if you set aside land for a reservation, if you set aside land in a treaty, it implied that there was water that was going to come with that. And that these rights are not lost by non-use. You cannot uh, lose these rights because you're not using your water rights. The courts also acknowledged that Native American water rights were reserved for things like growing crops, water for traditional tribal uses, hunting and fishing. So they really said, if you're gonna set aside this land, you also set aside the water. Now in California, this is an interesting case because there are no treaty tribes. And so when you're talking about what they call the priority date of when you're going to establish res reserved water rights, California tends to use the date of executive order or statute which created the Indian tribes reservation. And this is confusing in California because again, we have a number of tribes who had established rights to these areas way, way earlier than what you're talking about when the established reservation happened because of the unratified treaties that happened in the state of California. But when we also think about California in terms of water, what we need to remember is that we as tribal peoples don't just think about water as a right or a resource. We actually think about, uh, we actually think about it as something that can help us 
to understand how the world works and we think about it as an important way that we live and our relationship to it. So what I have always learned is that our rivers, our waters are like the veins of a whole system that has to work together. And when you look at how these veins work together, they feed each other. And so you're looking here at a whole system and we can't dam up an artery and expect it not to cause some kind of big effect in another part of the system. All these things are interconnected. And when we think about it that way, then maybe we write law and policy in a very different way because they work so interconnected to each other and we can't sacrifice one for the other and we need to think about it as a total system. This is actually a map that I love to show people. It is um, a mapping of all of the water, like the river watersheds throughout the United States. And what you notice is the way in which they feed into each other and how interconnected they are and how important they are to establishing what is a total system of the United States. And so I want you to look specifically here in the middle. If you look at this big pink area, that's actually the Missouri River water system, uh, the river system. So when you're talking about things like the the Dakota Access Pipeline movement, they're talking about the potentiality of spilling um, oil or polluting a system that is this big and feeds this much of the United States in a very interconnected way. So we're not just talking about one part, we're talking about the whole thing when we're thinking about our water and our river systems. Now this doesn't mean that it's the same kind of values that have come to us through invasion and colonization. And if you look at the gold rush in particular in California, what you see is that they started to use water as a weapon and they started to use water to destroy things. And so while water is life and it has a way that it can interconnect us and it can build so much for us, in this case, they were weaponizing water. They were using it to blow up mountains. They were taking off like the sides of hills. They were, they were blowing things into the river. They were doing things to basically destroy just to get at the gold. And when we think about the gold rush in California, we often don't think about it as an environmental destruction, but it was on top of everything. It was a genocide. It was a genocide also of the land. It was a genocide of the water. It was what um, I've heard a very, a very dear like friend colleague of mine, Chisa Oro say is an eco side. They really went after what we were doing here and they made our water into a weapon. This continues to this day. Water again is used against indigenous peoples who are trying to fight for like land, resources, water and life as a weapon. These are photos that came from the Dakota Access Pipeline when they were protesting the building of the pipeline. Um, and I will say that it shows you the way that they weaponize water against indigenous peoples. And this is a very different way of thinking about water and relationship to water, where water isn't like in indigenous context, water is not just a resource. It is something that we are in relationship to. And in this case, you see they're using water as a weapon. And so when those two types of views of what we're doing is coming in, we need to consider what that means for how we build law policy and activism and advocacy. So I ask people to think about to end if you're already part of an organization, how can your organization work to amplify indigenous led struggles and be accountable to your communities. I think when we think about the law, we think about it is that it is just and it is created to protect justice. When we think about policy, we often think that people are writing policy with the best interest of people. But we need to remember that the law has been has existed primarily to criminalize indigenous peoples and to legitimize the ongoing colonization of California. So our rights enshrined into law and policy are never considered in a way that actually supports what we're trying to do. And what they do is they pass laws that inhibit how we can interact with our resources and our water and trying to say that they need to separate us from that because they're trying to say that the land is theirs, that they're the ones who's supposed to be in charge. And so I want to end with this. If we think about what it means to create policy and to bring policy together under understandings of tribal sovereignty, we need to remember that consultation is not collaboration and that consultation is not upholding the sovereignty of indigenous nations. Because when you're talking about a nation to nation 
um, agreement or a nation to nation partnership. That's not about consulting. That's about building an actual collaboration or co-management of things. And I make the argument all the time that when people are doing this work, they need to remember a couple of things. Indigenous peoples are centered in everything that you do because they are the ones who have these uh, real in-depth long connections to water, to fish, to life, to the land. And we need to think about how we can understand that and build that into policy. So Zoe Todd is a great person to look up if you're building policy and you don't and you want to start talking about it in a very different way. She talks about how you need to understand the role of humans and animals as active agents in political and social environments. You need to think about the role of the of what she calls the more than human beings in the things that you're doing. And she wants to remind us that we need to incorporate the relationships between humans and animals and the co-management frameworks so that we are talking more about relating and engaging and considering what she says in her work, fish have agency, fish have like needs, fish have rights, fish are the people that we like, they're people that we need to think about. We cannot just center human life and human agency in the things that we do. And what I end with is this. So if you want to read more about kind of the work that I do with po the politics of water, we do have this special issue of decolonization. It's called Indigenous Peoples and the Politics of Water, written by, and the introduction is written by um, Melanie Yazi and myself. And what we talk about is that if you're going to make decolonizing water policy, you need to think about remaking our accountability in relationship to water and reclaiming our relational theories of water culture to remind us that we are water-based and that we have water memory. And think about what's our responsibility to water, not what is water's responsibility to me, but what is my responsibility to water? And we say this, good at making relatives. It's what we do, it's who we are. Our relatives are our source of strength. We are not afraid when we are surrounded by relatives. We will have no future without relatives. We will have no future if we are bad relatives. And so we say to be a water protector is to be a good relative. To be a land defender is to be a good relative. To struggle together is to be a good relative. And if you want to be a good relative, you should be an indigenous feminist. And that's where I will end today with my very, very quick overview. Awesome. Um, well, my name is Regina Chikazola, and I am the co-director of Safe California Salmon. And um, Safe California Salmon is um, very much committed to making sure that both people and fisheries have uh, access to clean water and to restoring um, our fisheries to um, a harvestable level so that people can have fish to eat and to, re um, to honor in every way. Um, and I also wanted to say that I'm here right now um, in, uh, on Yurok land um, in Klamath. And I um, just wanted to give thanks to the Yurok tribe for um, letting me be on their land. And I live on Karuk land in Orleans, California. Um, today, I'm going, to, I'm going to be speaking about water policy in California and how it relates specifically to federal water policy and also that the rights that tribes might have within water policy in California and federally that, um, uh, that are different and, and than, other, than, a regu than a, any other person that's not tribe, that's not a tribe. It is a government to government relationship like Kutcha said, and tribes also have things like their own EPA, first in, right, first in line water rights. So um, I'm going to try to share my screen right now and hopefully it works. And the area that I live in does not have the best internet. So hopefully this works out well. If not, Kutcha has a copy of this. Um, okay. It'll just take me one second. Sorry about the slow internet, like I said. Okay, so this is called Understanding California Law and Policy. I'm gonna go through it very quickly since we started a little late today. Um, and hopefully if anyone has any questions at the end, um, 
then I can answer them. I also like to say that there are a lot of people on this call that know a lot more about uh, water law and policy than I do. And I am happy to be corrected. So, um, and some of the things I'm gonna talk about involve case law, which is rapidly changing. And so this presentation actually will have information that I'll have to update based on that. So um, in California and nationally, there are laws for public participation when there are major decisions to be made, and they do play into how we manage the water. There are um, NEPA and CEQA, the National Environmental Policy Act and the California Environmental Quality Act. Um, these require a series of comment periods um, for different kinds of, for different projects and different significance. So um, there, I'll go into now what those comment periods look like. But it's very important that if you're an organization that really either wants to take direct action or litigate a project that you don't agree with in water policy, that you do engage in the public process because it gives you standing so you can litigate later. But also these are opportunities for organizing. They're opportunities to set up um, lawsuits and to set up petitions and to try to change the process. But they're also opportunities to make sure you have standing to litigate later within the process. Um, so the first part of a process, both in CEQA and NEPA, is a scoping process. Um, these are usually about 30 days and often they include a public hearing. Um, sometimes there are situations where they'll decide that there only needs to be a waiver or that there only needs to be an EA and not a full environmental impact statement or environmental impact report. Um, and then that's heavily debated when you'll need a full EIS or an EA. Um, so you'll come up, you'll have the draft environmental impact statement or EA after you go through the scoping process. And the scoping process is usually about 30 days long. Um, the EIS process is usually a little longer, 60 to 90 days long. And in the scoping process, you're just being asked to um, look at what the project might be, say the example is the relicensing of the Klamath Dams, and to put out all the issues that might exist around that. Um, so this is a, a part where you can bring up issues like water is life, water is important, you're not looking at these as whole systems. Um, whereas an EIS or an EA is supposed, or um, a CEQA document that's equivalent, is supposed to have all the information. Every significant issue is supposed to be included in that document. After that, you go into a finding of no significant impact or a decision notice, and it's called all different kinds of things in California. Um, but that is your opportunity to litigate, but I'm gonna go into that more later. <clears throat> or it's also your opportunity to start setting up protests if that's what your um, goal in following the process is. When you're working with NEPA and CEQA, it's really important to look at, um, to work in diverse alliances. And the reason it is, is everyone that you work with will probably have different issues. All the different tribes you work with, all the different organizations, the fishermen, they all have different ways that they're impacted. Um, and you need to, in this process, develop your standing. You need to show that you are impacted by what is happening here. Tribes obviously have strong standing in every situation. Um, however, not everyone does. So if you're not um, part of a tribe, a lot of times your standing might be that you use the river a lot, you take photos on the river. You do not have the ability to litigate if you do not have standing. Um, all of, once you get into NEPA and CEQA, um, you are now going to invoke your tribe. There's going to be tribal trust responsibilities, and Kutcha went into that a little bit. In the past, in California, CEQA did not invoke that, but tribal trust responsibilities necessarily. Now that there is a new law, AB 52, that says that there needs to be tri tribal consultation for projects that go through CEQA. So that's um, state and local processes that the state is handling. <clears throat> and this is um, really interesting too because it's a new law, so it's kind of being figured out as we go along, but it seems like it's a little stronger than some of the um, consultation process than federally, just because um, the tribes have the right to say the process is not over in that. But um, how that is going to work out, we're still seeing this law is only about two years old as far as I know. So how do you find out about these projects? Um, you can check your federal register notices. 
You can file with FERC to be on their, on their uh, list. You can check the Water Board's website. Um, you can check the Department of Pesticide, uh, the Pesticide Regulation websites. You can look for alerts on your favorite environmental justice group or environmental group's websites. Um, and then there's other sites that are just for looking up CEQA. Um, you can get on mailing lists through the state. So um, there's a lot of ways to find out about these processes, but if you go to a public meeting, you should sign up on their list because then you'll get emails letting you know when it's time for your comment periods. <clears throat> so once you get into the NEPA and CEQA public participation projects, a lot of other laws start coming into play. And how they come into play is ch changes often, actually, um, kind of based on base uh, case law, but also based on how the laws are changing. Um, so you have the Endangered Species Act, both federally and in the state of California has its own Endangered Species Act. And that is triggered when a process is happening that will affect the habitat of a species that's endangered or threatened. When the Endangered Species Act comes into play, because it's federal, you also have tribal trust responsibility coming into play. Um, so even though, say, um, Coho are listed in the Klamath River and um, Chinook are not, the um, tribal trust responsibility for the Chinook does come into play because of that. Um, so NEPA now has been invoked also with um, biological assessments and opinions based on the Endangered Species Act, which is somewhat new in the last 10 years as far as I know, um, but it's good because it's more opportunities for the public to comment and try to get significant information into the record. Um, yeah, so the way that the biological opinion happens, too, is that there is consultation with the agencies that are responsible for fisheries. Um, so an example would be that if the, the Bureau of Reclamation or Federal Energy Regulatory Commission wanted to do a federal action, they would have to consult. Um, in California, the consultation has more um, goes through the Department of Fish and Wildlife. So then we get into the Clean Water Act, and this is a pretty strong law, but it's administered by states. Um, so there's two ways that the Clean Water Act is administered. One is through NPDES permits, and then that's just a fo straight federal process. Um, and that's strong, it's that's for point sources, if something comes, pretty much means if the pollution comes out of a pipe. Um, however, the law on NPDES permits changes rapidly, like most water law. Um, the Clean Water Act also establishes um, the establishment of beneficial uses, and then it also establishes things like total maximum daily loads, which I think of kind of as pollution control plans. And um, most of these different processes also have some kind of CEQA process involved. There's also a process through this when you go into energy projects through the Clean Water Act that's a 404 or 401 certification. 404s go through the Army Corps of Engineers. That's a situation like what we saw in Standing Rock. Um, and a 401 permit goes through, usually goes through the states. Right now, the EPA just filed a law to limit states and tribes abilities to use the 401 certification process. Um, I'm sure that will go straight to court, so we don't really know what's going to happen with the 401 certification process at this time. But that law has gone to the Supreme Court, and it's been held up that states have the rights to deny environmentally harmful projects through the 401 certification process. So when you get into the Clean Water Act, what's important to realize is that it's mainly, unless it's an NPDES permit, and even those kind of are administered through the states. So in California, we're in a pretty good situation because we have stronger clean water laws than a lot of other states do. Um, California also has its own Endangered Species Act, but um, that seems to be a lot weaker than the way it, it, they administer the Clean Water Act. And I'm sure there are people on this call that might not agree with me. So um, I'm gonna focus more just on the Clean Water Act um, and this, and I'm gonna go into a little bit about how the Clean Water Act works in the state of California and how water rights go work in the state of California now. Well, one thing to remember is when you're looking at the Clean Water Act too, it's really um, broken up into point source pollution and non-point pollution. So non-point pollution is like every, all the pollution that washes off of, um, say, a farmer's field and goes into the river, or non-point pollution might be toxic algae going from one watershed into another. Most of the pollution 
in the West is non-point pollution. It's not actually coming from a sewage treatment plant and being put into a river through a pipe. Um, so states that don't have strong non-pollution laws um, are, it's not good. It means that there's a lot more pollution. And even though California does have some good non-pollution laws, um, it's not actually a non-point source pollution laws. They're not strictly enforced, unfortunately. It's often up to the citizens to enforce those laws. So who administers the state's water, clean water laws? We have the State Water Resources Control Board. Um, I'm not sure what happens to this slide, so I apologize for that. And I'm gonna keep moving quickly through this. So the state decides which watersheds are impaired. The state comes up with plans to control that impairment. They come up with like agricultural pollution plans and things of that nature. And then we have regional water quality control boards. I think my sense might've scribbled on my presentation and I apologize to you guys for that. Um, so we have the regional water quality control boards, and they um, are usually responsible for um, anything to do with making the plans in the state, if it's a local plan, and the state's responsible for statewide permits that people can be covered under. But ultimately, the state water board has to approve most of the regional water board's plans and decisions. And then also the California EPA has to approve a lot of them too, such as TMDLs. And um, I'm going to put this online so people can see it better. But um, you know, things that could be regulated um, are things like uh, you know establishing flow criteria, waste discharge requirements, ag waivers, beneficial uses, um, how cannabis is regulated. Most of the important decisions in the state really come down to the regional boards. And this is really a problem in our region or in our part of the state because. Um, the regional board is in Santa Rosa and they're located very far from the Klamath River and the Smith River, the Eel Rivers. And so they don't do a whole lot within this region. They don't focus a lot on this region. So we really have to um, push them a lot. So water rights are different. They're administered by the Division of Water Rights. And um, it's important to realize that tribal rights, like Hutcha said, and water rights are first in line. Um, there's been a lot of decisions lately on recognized, non-recognized, and terminated tribes um, as far as water rights. Um, in, say, the Klamath tribe in Oregon, they were um, terminated, and yet they did a water rights adjudication, and they won senior water rights within the Klamath River watershed, even though they were a terminated tribe. So there was a lot of debate before that on whether or not um, if tribes were terminated or if their rancherias and things of that nature, if they still held water rights. Um, so there are there is some case law saying that they do, and that's pretty interesting. And the, um, so some uh, more often than not, when it comes to federal projects, the federal government will hold water rights on behalf of, um, say, the Klamath project. Uh, so the Bureau of Reclamation will hold those rights and it's not actually the individual farmers that do. And that, but there are places where the individual farmers do hold water rights. And so um, water rights can become really tricky and the, the older the water right, the more powerful the water right. And in California, a lot of the rivers, there are water rights that are in excess of 10 times, 15 times what there actually is water in the river especially when it comes to some of these older water rights too. So um, California really needs to go over its water rights system and needs to figure out a better way of doing this because paper water is such an extreme situation in California. There's also such a thing as riparian water rights, which means that they're way less regulated than other types of water rights. Groundwater is just starting to be regulated in California. Um, and until recently, groundwater had not been as subject to tribal water rights, but there are new cases, including in California, such as Agua Caliente. Um, and there's cases also in Nevada saying tribes do have senior water rights to groundwater resources also. Um, so, and there's also new laws and case law related to how groundwater and surface water interact because if the groundwater does interact with the surface water, then it's supposed to be heavily, more heavily regulated. Um, so that one of the ways that water rights is regulated is through an adjudication. 
adjudications are long processes and when they happen there are opportunities to file protests and um, there's also opportunities to file protests when water right applications happen um, sometimes these processes you have to be careful getting into them because they can be extensive like the twin tunnels um, water rights hearings were i think maybe six or seven months long and they were supposed to go for another six or seven months before they decided to just do a one tunnel proposal so it's really important you have a lot of support collaboration and hopefully lawyers that will work for pretty cheap in this situation where you're going into adjudications. When you do, if there are tribes involved, they usually will win the senior water rights of the adjudication or they will always win as far as I've seen. So um, it's just really important to always think that where are you, what are the tribes in the area and make sure that you're respecting the fact that they do have senior water rights. Um, so now a decision is made and what do you do? The, at, the end of, at the end of the NEPA process, which I talked about earlier, and the CEQA processes, you will have a decision. And when this happens, you'll have a period that you can appeal. In CEQA, it's about 30 to 60 days. Um, NEPA, I think it's usually 30. I'm not sure if there's um, situations where it's more than that. NEPA, it's called a record of decision. Uh, it's called other things for CEQA. I know CEQA a little less well, but. Um, so anyway, this is the time. The decision's made. What do you do? You appeal. Sometimes there's an appeal resolution meeting. I have not seen those really go anywhere, um, usually. Sometimes there are decisions that are made that you can deal with it and figure it out. But um, so what you, what you have to decide at this point is if you want to file a lawsuit. And a lot of times you will decide to follow a lawsuit if you have lawyers and you're working with a good coalition. When the lawsuit is filed, you have to decide whether or not to try to get a temporary restraining order or an injunction. And this is the time where a lot of times um, direct action and public campaigns really come into play. Because especially when it's something like building a new pipeline or a project that is not beneficial to the watershed, um, the project will go forward, like the Trump water plan would be an example. It, goes, it, it starts going forward and they are actually doing the, the project that they proposed while the lawsuit proceeds. So we've lost a lot of battles. Well, for instance, the Dakota Access Pipeline would be a great example. They built that pipeline, but meanwhile, the tribe won year, years later, but the pipeline is built because they weren't able to get an injunction or a temporary restraining order. Um, but they tried to stop it through direct action. And I've actually seen that work quite a lot, actually, where um, community organizing and action held up a project long enough for a restraining order to get into place. And then the lawsuit ultimately to win. The Go Road is another perfect example of where at the end they won the lawsuit, but a lot of the project was built in the, in the process. Lawsuits can be very expensive, so it's really important you just don't go into them blindly and you have good coalitions. Now we get into how does the law work? Um, and then I'm gonna go really quickly through this last part, but the most important thing to remember, especially if you're a student or someone like that learning about the law, is that ultimately the way the law reads is not the way that the law it works. Um, case law is what really matters. Um, any the decisions that are made in the circuit courts and supreme courts are presidential presidential and um, it's going to be what decides what happens it's not just the way the law is written and so it's just important to look at the case law um, like say and look and see like agua caliente for instance or and look to see what has happened in the past because just because the law is on your side doesn't mean the case law is going to be on your side um, it's also really important to think about what case law you could be making because what you do is always going to affect everyone else that comes after you because of the way that a case law works. The way that the um, courts work is usually a law is filed in a district court. You either win or lose and then there can be an appeal and then you go into a higher court such as the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals or the state courts of appeals and then at the end is the Supreme Court and most water cases don't get that far but some of them do um, you know the fishing rights case for the Yurok tribe went all the way to the Supreme Court and they won and now the Yurok tribe has fishing rights to the Klamath River um, so I can't I don't remember how long that case took to go through the court system 
but it probably took a really long time. And I know a lot of the people who ended up getting arrested for fishing during that time were considered felons and did not have jobs, um, weren't able to get jobs and things of that nature while this court case played out. So it's just important to think when you get into this, especially if you are trying to set good case law, you could be looking at the long haul, you could be looking at 10 years um, or more even. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's good to think about how committed you are when you go into these processes, whether you're looking at it from the direct action point of view or the filing lawsuits point of view. So the, another thing to realize about the law and case law is that it's rapidly changing. For a one certification case law for dams and pipelines would be a great, a great um, example of that. The, it's changed so much in the last few years that you practically have to be a lawyer to understand how fast it's changing and how it's going to work. Um, so it's really good you have great legal advice and that you just really pay attention. Ag waiver case law in California is changing really quickly. It used to be that pesticides were not considered a point, point source, but in some pesticide application, but in some cases now they are. Um, biological opinion NEPA case law are changing quick. Tribal trust and rights cases also change very quickly. Like I said a few years ago, we weren't even aware that, um, or I mean, people theorized that groundwater was subject to, tr to tribal trust and tribal water rights, but uh, you know, um, the lawyers would say that, but there wasn't a lot of case law that prove it, proved it, and now there is. Um, there's also issues of federal versus preemption, but I'm not really going to go into that, but that is something you need to be aware of. So a lot of times the feds will say that they have the rights that the states actually claim also. Um, so I'm almost done. So in some important case law for people who are planning to look at this presentation online would be the Scott River groundwater case that just happened, saying that groundwater is um, part of um, regulating groundwater if it interacts with surface water is a public trust responsibility under the state of California's constitution. Um, so that was an important case that's related to the Mono Lake case um, as far as regulating water for the public trust. Uh, another one is United States versus a deer one and two, that's the Klamath tribes. Um, water rights case cases, um, the, two, the two decisions that were made. It's not the adjudication. The states are actually the ones that do adjudications, but they need to pay attention to the federal law in those adjudications saying that the tribes are first in line, first in rights. Um, Yurok tribe versus the Bureau of Reclamation case, that is like ongoing. And right now, the Jurok tribe actually just lost a bid for, or the judge refused to step in on a bid for an injunction for more flows for the Klamath salmon. And we lost about 90% of our juvenile salmon this year because of that decision. Um, but, and then there's all different kinds of ones. There's um, the Trump water plan, uh, biological opinion cases in the court right now. California is actually suing on our side for that. Um, there's Agua Caliente, which is where a tribe won the rights to the groundwater supply, but the way that that case is playing out right now is the judge is saying water quality doesn't necessarily play into it. So when you're looking, if you're really interested in figuring out how all this works, the case law is where you're gonna learn the most. And so why is this important is the end of this. Why is this important if you're not a lawyer, if you're not working for an environmental group? Well, knowing how the law works in the public in the public opportunities and comment periods work really help you out as a community organizer. Um, an example would be that there was just a comment period for the new one tunnel proposal, Bay Delta tunnel proposal, and um, over 200 tribal members from seven different tribes showed up for the Reading hearing for that and brought up a lot of significant issues as part of that scoping meeting that now will be in, included in all of the documents to come because of all those people showing up and talking about the way that they use their rivers. Um, and the only reason that hearing even happened is because some youth from the Hoopa Valley Water Protectors Club went and asked for that hearing at a different hearing. So, um, this is a place where you can really use community organizing to make a difference too and make sure that everyone's voices are heard. Um, another example of where using all the different tools as part of the public process played out well is in the Klamath Rivers Dam's FERC process. They were able to use corporate campaigning and advocacy, the law, settlements, all these scientific processes, all to make a, perf a campaign that is actually probably gonna lead to the Klamath Dams coming down. So, um, 
And there's a lot of things that happen that were good as good and bad, depending on your opinion, and it's part of that process. But the fact that the activists were also following the legal processes and the public processes in that is a lot of the reason why there was so much pressure to get those dams down. And um, just going into the Klamath a little more, um, and I'm going to do it quickly. Some of the things that played in are the FERC process, the NEPA process, tribal trust. I mean, dams are only relicensed every 50 years, so there were no laws pertaining to the operation of the Klamath dams for a long time, and there really still isn't. Um, and because the process is not done yet. So when you get into um, relicensing processes under FERC, um, things do get a little more complicated, but it's important you know when those comment periods are. Um, in the Klamath, we were able to use all these different laws and processes to push for fish passage, which is required under the Federal Power Act if you can prove that there was fish above the dams. And there was a lot of science that had to go into proving that and a lot of documentation of, um, you know, old fish heads from forever ago and things of that nature. But ultimately the Klamath tribe mainly was able, and the different tribes scientists were able to prove that salmon were above those dams. And once fish passage was required, it economically became no longer viable for Pacific Corps to continue to, to, continue to have those dams in, mainly. Um, like I said, the Klamath situation is a complicated one to use because there's so much good and bad that came out of that. But this is also a place where the 401 certification process really came into play. Um, we were able to get toxic algae listed as a pollutant on the Klamath River, and the toxic algae is mainly created from those dams, from them stagnifying the water. Um, so, and that toxic algae is released in the river at such a point that it's a nuisance. So that really made it so that the 401 certification through the state of California would have been very hard to get and possibly impossible. So um, knowing how all these laws fit together and where the opportunities for direct action really made, and for the opportunities to make the best available science really made it so we could be stronger in getting these dams down and will ultimately lead to dams down. And in the end, um, just including some important websites. This is how you get your federal register notices, your meetings on the water boards, state boards, Bureau of Reclamation, Department of Water Resources, Ocean Protection Councils, Air Resources Board, and the governor's office. And um, these, this presentation will be at our, on our website, probably not till next week, but um, this is how you can, who you can get a hold of, the websites you can go to to figure out what's happening. And um, that is the end of my presentation. Sorry, I went a little bit over time. And I know I'm talking about some complicated things and I'm probably saying things that not everyone agrees with, especially lawyers being that law is rapidly changing within the state. I mean, it's almost impossible to keep track of unless you are a full-time lawyer. Um, but I just think it's important when you look at all these to remember always involve the local native people within your area when you're planning your campaign when you're planning your legal campaign and not just like once you've already decided what you're doing but from the very beginning know what the tribes are thinking know what they want to do i mean they might not want to tell you and that's fine but make sure that you you're trying that you're trying to support the people within the watersheds that you're working for and that you're not just supporting them once you figure out what you already want to do that you ask them ultimately what they want in the Klamath situation, it was the tribes that decided they wanted the dams down, and they decided it was down when people said it was absolutely impossible to do anything like that. And, um, you know, the environmentalists and different people involved supported that. And, and now we're probably going to get them down. But if it wasn't for the tribes putting that vision out, this would not, dam removal would not be happening. And um, all the tribes in the Klamath worked very hard in different ways to make that happen. So I just think it's really important. It's not just the Klamath where there's a lot of tribes working hard. It's all over the Bay Delta, it's San Francisco, it's Southern California, like Kutcha said, like there are people working hard for their watersheds throughout the state. And so just make sure that you know that history going into it. So you're not claiming you have a senior water right to the watershed or that your issue is more important than anyone else. to where there is enough left enough there so for, to live off of and they have that right under fishing rights so um that is the end of my presentation and if i have any questions i don't know how to answer i'm fine with saying that and um i will put this online and i just really wanted to thank um Kutcha and hsu for making all of this possible thank you 
So um, again, I want to thank everyone for bearing with us as we got started uh, a little bit late today. Um, I think we're working everything out so that our future, uh, our future, like uh, offerings are going to go pretty smoothly, and we should be right on time. We do have like a couple of moments that we could take if anybody wants to type into the chat any particular questions that they might just urgently want answered. I will encourage you to continue to come to the training sessions because many of your questions may be answered by some of the other people that we're bringing in to kind of fill in um, what is our speaker series. And the next thing we'll be doing again is going over the different watersheds, talking about the Klamath River, the Eel River, right? What's going on in the Sacramento Bay Delta uh, and in that watershed. So it'll give you some more context for some of the contemporary things that are happening right now and then the reasons why that they are there. Um, let's see. There's a question about if there's anywhere else besides the Google document where we need to sign up if we want to participate in the certificate programs. Uh, no. So if you just fill out the Google form, it asks you to say which sessions you're going to attend. So we make sure to send you the right information and then um, it gives you a little bit more information. So if, if you fill out that link, which I think uh, Carrie can just stick the link into the registration form. You should be all good to go and then we'll be able to track your progress. Just make sure if you're signed up for the certificate program that you fill out the evaluation form link that was sent to you that's also included in the program uh, because that helps us to track the people who have attended the courses. But in addition, we will be posting the this video up to the to YouTube will share it all over social media so that you can watch it later and then in the next iteration of the program we'll have links to the YouTube videos so that people can watch them and if you're in the certificate program and have to miss a session you can always watch it on YouTube and then fill out the evaluation form you have until October 1st to complete all of the requirements to get the certificate so it gives you a little bit of time if you need to go back and watch a few of them um let's see are any specific nas classes so yes nas actually at hsu we offer all of our classes through extended education as well as on campus so if you want to sign up for any of our classes you can we have a couple of classes that likely people who are interested in this work would be interested in the first is a tribal water rights class we do have a tribal water rights class which we offer uh, usually every two years in the spring this year, spring 2021, we will be offering tribal water rights. Um, they tend to be in-person classes, so that would mean you coming to campus to meet. This semester, we're not on campus, but we hopefully will be in the spring, and it gives you an opportunity to really learn about tribal water rights. We also offer Federal Indian Law 1 and Federal Indian Law 2. Federal Indian Law 1 is offered every year in the fall semester. And so this year, if you had an interest in taking an online Federal Indian Law course through HSU, all of our courses this fall are going to be online and they're going to be offered online. So you could sign up through extended education for any of our courses online. And one of them is Federal Indian Law 1 this fall. It'll go very in detail about the cases that shape Federal Indian Law, sovereignty, self-determination, and how we build policy. We also offer Federal Indian Law 2, which is the follow-up to that class that gets offered every other year. Another class that we offer that a lot of people like to take to learn a lot about sort of like the movements and social movements and advocacy is environmental justice. And again, environmental justice is offered every semester. And this semester in the fall will be offered online because all of our classes will be online. So you can sign up through extended education if you would like to, and you could take the class online uh, with the other students that are gonna be in the class. We also offer uh, Indigenous Natural Resource Management Practices as a course in the fall. That kind of goes into more detail as to the relationship that people have with Indigenous natural resources, the types of management practices that they used. So there's a number of courses I think that could help to kind of round out the work that we're doing uh, in this area. Um, Carrie did post into the chat the evaluation form and also uh, a link to the registration form. And I just, I wanna thank everybody again for uh, bearing with us for the, our first, our very first part of our speaker series. Um, next Friday at noon, we once again will be uh, here in the webinar and we'll be able to host people. And we're gonna be talking about what's going on with the Klamath River and Klamath River issues right now. 
And we should be able to go hopefully also live on Facebook next week. But if not, we will be posting videos to the YouTube. So I think that's um, about it for us. I don't know, Regina, if you have something to say. Nope. Thank you everyone for coming and thanks for dealing with our technology issues on this first okay. webinar. Um, yes, you will need a new link to attend next week. We will send you out the new link for next week if you're registered for the course. So each week you should get a new link for the course if you've actually clicked that you want to register for that course. So thank you everyone. Looking forward to seeing you again next week.